Good afternoon to all of you. Uh, welcome to uh, the sixth season of the Wednesday webinar. We are gathered here today with a August panel to understand Gen Z, to understand Gen Zs, how to innovate for them, how to drive consumption, perhaps much needed. The R word behind us or you know chasing us, I do not know, uh, but we definitely will learn a lot from this panel of very experienced people uh, with consumers, and and we are also bringing to you a lot of data that will support some of the things that the panel will speak about. Diana, can you can you go to the next slide, please? As I mentioned before, we are in the season six. Welcome again to MRSI's Wednesday webinars. Next slide, please. A quick introduction to the uh, webinar panel. Uh, you know, you have pictures of uh, uh, quite a few. Very good looking gentleman here. I hope we soon have somebody from the, uh, you know, from some of the ladies on this panel. Perhaps you can come on to the webinar panel as well in the near future. But quickly, Amitabh, uh, Sundar, Mukul, Samir, and Jayesh, uh, to read the content that we bring to you. Uh, today, I'm also wearing the hat of host. I'm Sundar Muthuraman. Quickly again uh, uh, about MRSI for those of you who have not been with us in the past. Established in 1998, uh, MRSI is a not-for-profit association of providers and buyers of research and insights. The purpose of MRSI is to create awareness of the industry among public at large, as well as the government, establish and promote professional standards. And of course, like the Wednesday webinar, there are several other forums where MRSI uh, provides a platform for professionals to engage and showcase their work and collaborate on common issues. Uh, next slide, please. Today we have with us uh, Aditya Kal, Group group Account Director from Canter. Welcome, uh, Aditya. Anjana Pillai, who perhaps needs no introduction if you, you've been regular to our webinar. Anjana, welcome again. He's partner in India Board Member of Quantum Consumer Solutions. Ashwini has been with us as well in some of the sessions in the past. Welcome again. Uh, she is a group services line leader. So that's a full Ipsos UU and SIA. I'm always flummoxed with all the abbreviations. And Gautam, who's like I mentioned earlier, is part of the webinar panel um, and he's also a panelist today. Uh, he's vice president and chief capacity building uh, at Purple Audacity. Welcome all. Um, quite happy to have you on board. Uh, you know, I've always been you know confused about the boomers and the Gen Xs and the Millennials and the Gen Zs. Uh, you know, I hope you can throw some light on that so that I can figure out whether I'm actually Gen Z, irrespective of whether I was born in the right year or not. Perhaps I have some of those attitudes. Uh, so we'll move on uh, and leave the session to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Diana, if you can go to the next slide. And I guess, Aditya, you're beginning and uh, share us your views. Over to you. First time audible to everyone. So uh, thanks, Sundar, for this introduction. And thanks, Amarasa, for giving me the opportunity to present on this. Uh, in this section that we have covered, we'll see how differentiated or productive is similar Gen Z is with the rest of the generation and how they see themselves and interact with the world around them. So those are the themes that essentially we are covering in this uh, segment. Next slide. So uh, with a 40% share within the decision-making age group, understanding Gen Z is vital for all the marketers to make informed strategic decisions. Gen Z as a segment represents the significant market across categories. And further, what we see is that they're markedly different in terms of the attitudes as compared to other generations. Next slide. So uh, let me first explain the chart out here. So um, we have looked at top two box scores in terms of the agreement with various attitudinal statements and index these scores among Gen Z to scores among rest of the population. And we have used this format for all of our slides in this section. So uh, coming back to the insights part, first and foremost, the generation has high dependency on mobile and internet which plays a key role in their social interactions. There is a strong and differentiated influence of social media that is visible on this generation. 
Next slide. Further, role of internet has also moved up the funnel and, in, and is influencing Gen Z consumers at a very early stage in their path to purchase. The case in point is Gen Z are more likely to search internet for products that are advertised on T, uh, TV. It's not the, no longer just the bottom of the funnel. So clearly there, uh, the digital medium for Gen Z is moving beyond the realm of performance marketing. Next slide. So armed with this power of internet and information therein, we see a decreased brand loyalty among Gen Z. They're more likely to be attracted to special offers. And if availability for a particular brand is an issue, it's easy to move on for this generation to an alternate brand. Next slide. If we try to understand the root of it, a lot is rooted in their traits of being high on individualism, low on regrets. And Gen Z at an overall level are more appreciative of themselves compared to the rest of the generations. Next slide. They're quite conscious about their personal appearances. And this also manifests into their actions for the categories. So this generation essentially has a very high affinity towards usage of beauty and skincare products, for example. Next slide. So the trade of individualisms and no regret can also be seen uh, when it comes to their career choices. Gen Z are actually more inclined to change jobs frequently for their career growth. And at the same time, they also look for balance uh, in terms to, uh, so that they can pursue their own personal interests. So that is a dichotomy that is there. Yeah. Next slide, please. And finally, uh, if you see Gen Z, uh, they prefer to live by their own beliefs and values which is also true for other generations. But what is interesting is that they show a higher inclination towards a joint family setup. Now we can always deep dive further into uh, Gen Z. If we dig deeper, we find that there is a variability in their choices by regions and by town class. A Gen Z in a South market is quite different from a Gen Z in an East market. As we see here that there's a stronger desire in South and in metros to change culture codes of the past. Hence, marketers need to understand this variability due to the culture and regional references that are there so that they can develop their strategies to target these digital natives. Now, to further zoom in into Gen Z, I would request Anjana to take us through the details of who they are. Over to you, Anjana. Can you all hear me? I'm, I'm guessing you yes. all can. Yes. All right, yes, great. Uh, thank, you. Yeah. thank you for setting the context, uh, Sundar and Aditya. Now, uh, and those data points um, were indeed very interesting. So now we zoom into Gen Z to understand who they truly are, right? Um, trying to look at their personas, uh, you know, their worldview, their ideologies, their value systems. Now, what I have uh, here on this slide is a pen portrait of a Gen Z consumer, right? So meet, meet Rahul, he's 18 years old, he's a you know, college uh, kid, he goes to college, he lives with his parents and siblings. Now, when you talk to him, you engage with him and you try to understand his interests and hobbies and his activities, he will tell you that he um, he's definitely on face, not on Facebook because Facebook is the space for relatives and really old relatives, etc. He is he's hanging out on Snapchat and Instagram. 
he, ha he definitely has a TV at home, but he prefers watching OTT content like Modern Love is what he watches. Um, when you ask him about Coke, uh, he talks about, you know, the Ronaldo incident and uh, the, the huge, I mean, the $4 billion drop in brand valuation as a result of that. If you look at his role models, they're really successful startup owners and people who've got good valuation for creating, you know, brands after, after their uh, beliefs, right? So, uh, again, if you look at the, uh, he'll talk about social media, influencers, etc. Now, when you look at this pen portrait, it, it's kind of difficult to guess uh, where Rahul lives because he could be anywhere in the country, right? So the point that I'm trying to make here is that this Rahul, I mean, the details that I've picked up, uh, you know, for this presentation actually lives in Gorakhpur, right? So next, uh, yeah, so he, he comes from Gorakhpur. Moving on to the next slide. So basically what we're really saying is that um, while we cannot paint all of Gen Z with the same brush, we're not for a minute saying that they're a homogenous bunch with similar interests and beliefs and value systems. That not, that's not what we're saying. But what is important to note is that because of the socio-cultural context that they are born into, there is a distinctness that they come with vis-a-vis -vis the previous cohorts, right? So, the, so there are unique priorities that, that they come with. There is a worldview that's distinctly different from the previous generational cohorts, and that's, that's what we want to uh, establish here. Now, why is that, right? One of the reasons why that is, is that if, if, if you look at them, they're the first non-socialist generation, right? This is the first generation where consumption was actually encouraged and not curbed. So that, that makes them uniquely different from the, from the previous generational cohorts. Moving on to the next slide. What we also see, I mean, this is widely known about them, but there is a democratized access to, to the digital space, right? So if you look at Gen Z across India, whether it's the small towns or the big cities, there is a social imagination that actually links their lived realities with their desired realities, right? And all of this, we all know, they have access to similar OTT content, even, even people in the smaller towns are seeking, you know, international content. Um, there is, uh, you know, the, the influencers, the Instagram influencers, the YouTube influencers are the same across the big towns and the, the big cities and the small towns. We know that there is an e-com uh, boom that has actually given them equal access to whether, whether it's fashion or tech or accessories. They also have a similar kind of a social imagination when it comes to, you know, um, passions and career paths, right? So, um, so therefore, like I said earlier, earlier you'll see patterns across uh, both cities and big cities and small towns in India, uh, you know, similar patterns across big cities and small towns as far as the Gen Z goes. Moving on. So what, what is it that, that makes them uniquely different from other generational cohorts, right? One of, the, one of the first things and one of the most interesting things about them is that if you look at this generation, probably they have the ability to choose between many, many options and also the, the, the choice is between equally good options, right? And when, when they do have this realization, there is a great need to try out try out new things. So, so if you examine them closely, you'll see that they, they do not have great interest in following linear goals, right? So, so they're not looking at career paths and career progression similar to the, to the older age cohorts. Um, delayed gratification is and, 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 and permanence. These are two things that, are, that perhaps they do, do not resonate with, right? So, so basically what we're saying is whether you look at education or occupation or personal relationships or consumption, we see a tendency amongst this cohort to keep to keep things open right to change paths uh, in the middle to not go after linear goals but to but to chase exponentiality moving on yeah so so because of the access to to so much they're also constantly searching. They want far too much, far too soon. Um, but what I what I must also say is that this is not a passive quest. This is an active quest. It's a it's a bit of an impatient one, but but it's an active quest. Now, if if I may use the word, it's it's actually like a constant, uh, you know, being on dopamine kind of a mantra, right? So you're constantly searching, and therefore you quickly skim, you quickly scan, then you look, and then you move on to the next. You see that kind of a that kind of a behavior amongst uh, amongst the Gen Z. Moving on. 
So we spoke about mindsets so and opinions of small town Gen Z and the metro Gen Z, right? So they, they're very similar in terms of aspiration. So if you look at them, the kind of brands they wear, the kind of clothes they, uh, you know, wear, the kind of music that they listen to, um, th there are lots of similarities. But what probably differentiates the small town Gen Z from the metro Gen Z is really the, the fact that they do not have the kind of access and opportunities that the Gen Z in the big cities have. And therefore, we, we do see some differences across these two uh, you know, uh, sets of audiences. In fact, in the small town, we find that they're actually trying and working harder to get aspirational employment. So the big, the big techies in the country, uh, you know, they, you'll see them on the list of the of the small town Gen Z's because they're really trying very, very hard to get aspirational employment. Um, you'll see that the desire to, to go to premium educational institutes is way higher amongst the small town Gen Z consumers. You'll see that they also, they do realize, I mean, they do know the codes of you know being gen z right but they, they, there's also a certain caste and class and sensibility setback that they're trying to overcome and and they, they're looking to skill up they're looking at on online grooming tools they're looking to learn to actually reduce the sensibility gap and this this uh, caste and class gap that they that they experience moving on so therefore, how do we understand them them better, right? And one of one of the things that's absolutely clear is that they are experiencing a youth that's significantly different from any other previous generation in India. So therefore, what we're trying to do in the next few slides is try and understand um, all the varied influences on their life, and therefore trying to trying to see what is it. Who is it that they truly are, and how does this manifest itself across various consumption choices? Um, what these things could mean, uh, you know, for for brands and marketeers in terms of designing uh, designing for them, right? So moving on. All right, and one of the first things that we need to look at here is where is their sense of self coming from, right? Where is, uh, you know, what what do they draw from? And and if you look at Gen Z, what's what's clear is that there is a there is an ascriptive identity, which is really about you know where they come from, right? The family that they're born into, the kind of values and beliefs and habits of the family that shape them, the ethnicity, the location that uh, that they come from. All of this is a is an unaltering reality, right? All the cultural influences that this comes with is is unaltering in their lives. And then on the other hand, you have the achieved identity, which is really their chosen identity. So their appearance, their interest, their work, their lifestyle, all of that is really a part of their chosen identity. So, so therefore, if you, if you look at both these aspects, when you look at ascriptive identity or the social identity, there is some bit of tension and conflict, right? They feel a little shackled by that identity because it is about conforming, it is unaltering. Whereas on the other hand, if you look at the achieved identity, there is a lot more freedom to explore. There is a, there is a lot more freedom to be. There is a lot of freedom to self, to express themselves in, in that space. Moving on to the next slide. All right. So this is this is exactly what's happening, right? They're constantly toggling between these two identities, the personal and social identities. And while social identities are restrictive, they, they do form, you know, boundaries in terms of how much agency and expression expression they have within that space. If you look at their personal identities, there is a lot of uh, and a lot of this you will see in the online space, right? There is a there is a lot of expression there. You'll see take any Instagram page of, of any Gen Zer, and you'll see that they, they're trying to create or carve a unique brand of themselves through the various interests, right? So it, it's like, it's a, what you see here is a concoction of various interests that define their personas and personalities. So the, the online space is really the space of expression, the space of freedom, where they're, they're trying to express the very strong sense of individuality, whereas the, the more social space is more about, you know, um, do, do constrain and, and uh, uh, you know, put some boundaries and restrictions on them. Moving on. So what is what is really clear is that if you look at the Gen Z audience, they do have a multiple and fluid sense, sense of identity, and and you'll see this way if if you were to look at their online personas, right? Now this is this is also very interesting from a from a branding point of view. Now as a brand, how do you create that sense of versatility in terms of how you operate or communicate with this audience, right? Or in terms of how you deliver your core proposition to this audience? How do you embrace this versatility to speak to them? It's it's quite clear that they have a 
range of range of options and diverse priorities which is why if you if you look at a lot of conversation around gen z you'll see that a lot of older generation you know they they do they they, they are kind of uncomfortable with this kind of a value system and with this kind of ethos right uh, gen z actually comes with an easy sense of entitlement that a lot of us including uh, you know the older generations do not understand i mean how is it that they're not prioritizing their career how is it that they're constantly prioritizing themselves over their career why is it that they cannot stick to one thing why are they so impatient why why cannot they handle any kind of delayed gratification a lot of things about them that the older cohorts older generational cohorts find very difficult to understand and therefore when when we do find them difficult to understand we do say oh they 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 entitled and you know they 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 just difficult people right um let's let's move on to the next slide so uh you know one of one of the interesting things to note here is that um when you look at social identities and when you look at uh, you know uh, personal identities and when you look at the role of family you see that for the gen zers um family parent parental and social approval and recognition is is very very important um in fact they do they do see this as a safety net while while independence and individuality and all of that is important um they do feel that they can access the resources that they have and interestingly what is important for us to remember here is that their parents are the gen xers right so they they've had access to affluence they've had access to you know globalization and the post liberalization um you know era um so they are also actively trying to be friends with gen zers right so there is there is an equation um with the gen zers that is a lot more friendly the parenting is a lot more friendly and from a gen z point of view parents are actually an important vehicle to negotiate with society right so it becomes a it, it becomes a vehicle for uh, for negotiation with society and that gives them a great sense of uh, safety and comfort moving on friends of course are central to the journey of identity formation right and and this you this you see that very clearly um where uh, the ability to learn from peers is very high and they keep augmenting themselves they learn from their peers and this is this is probably a defining character of this generation right um because consumption is so important collection of experiences is so important friends actually enable me to do things that i cannot do by myself right or things that i cannot do without the safety of numbers friends enable that so fr friends are absolutely critical to this uh, to this assembly of desired self and one of the one of the things for brands therefore to remember is how is it that you can you know forge a sense of community how you can how, how is it that you can design uh, you know for for a sense of community amongst the gen z because that that will be very impactful uh, you know amongst this uh, cohort moving on right so there is definitely a lot of toggling that happens like we spoke about earlier right there is a toggling between personal and social um there is a toggling between you know various identities between family and friends um within all of this we do find that gen z actually um is about horizontal conformity and vertical resistance right so they try very hard to differentiate themselves from from the previous uh, generational cohorts but there is certainly peer membership and group membership that they are seeking access to right now uh, one of the things that we find uh, about them is that they wish to create and not inherit right so that that's one of the that, that's one of the ethos uh, or, or um, you know one of the value systems that they come with and therefore they wish to really appear open minded right so um, i need to i need to definitely go beyond caste and class discrimination more importantly i need to come across as somebody who goes beyond caste and class discrimination i am you know i don't believe in gender inequality i have a much more broader sexual orientation etc there is a desire to you know to to appear this way right the other thing that we that we see about them is that they are about experience experiencing and not accumulating right so whether it's new food or new skills or new experiences they, that that's what they want to uh, you know that that's what they want to gain from uh, in fact we find that a lot of a uh, lot of students gen zers actually are looking at internships etc because you know it, it's like a big part of their uh, imagination of education because that's how they acquire new skills right um the other interesting thing that we notice about them is that they want to engage but not commit right so they will talk about a whole lot of social issues that are of concern to them but do they want to uh, occupy political positions of power um we don't see that happening right so um are they committed to voting 
no, we don't see, I mean, we don't know for sure that they'll all go out in, in large numbers to vote, for instance. So there is a there is a there is definitely um, a desire to engage, but not commit that that we see amongst this uh, this audience. Moving on to the next slide. Yeah, so because they have a wide range of social causes and concerns that they believe in, they also also think it's important to demonstrate the fact that they have the power to make a difference, right? So you'll see that it's a big part of their vocabulary. They 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 seek a seek a lot of pride in expressing it. They play an active role in 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 in, you know, in, in talking about it, uh, in making it a part of their uh, belief system, in expressing it to to the outside world. Moving on. Yeah, and in this context, like I said, a lot of social causes are, are, you know, they talk about how those are very important. Now, if you if you look at Gen Z, they do talk about the fact that progressiveness is is very important because if I'm not progressive, then I'm uncool, and progressiveness is extremely important to actually achieve group membership. Like like I was talking earlier, the the whole horizontal conformity that I was talking about, you know that that's very critical, right? So how do they define progressiveness in this context? Moral fluidity is a, is a huge sign of uh, of my progressiveness. The fact that I'm experiential, I'm trying many things, is again a part of you know how progressive I am. The fact that you know I'm I'm not looking at traditional work, uh, a, a traditional kind of a work definition, but I'm entrepreneurial is what defines my progressiveness. The fact that I'm socially concerned about you know equality, climate racism, discrimination, sustainability, all of this defines my progressiveness. And all of this is actually very, very carefully crafted to achieve that, that group membership. And you also see this in terms of, you know, the sex, their sexual signaling or status signaling, right? So in terms of sexual signaling, we see that Gen Z, uh, you know, talks about how comfortable they are with their sexuality and romance, uh, about their physical appearance. There is, there is greater engagement um, in, in, you know, in vanity, in taking selfies, trying out different looks etc even in terms of status signaling i mean the status signaling that we see amongst gen z is again in terms of exposure my global influences my global sensibilities that are not really limited to where i come from but is much broader uh, than that in terms of my experiences so what have i acquired right in terms of tunnel talent in terms of my skills so it's beyond you know material items um, and and that's what they're seeking in terms of experiences also in terms of appearance right the kind of brands i wear the kind of clothing I wear, all of this is a, is a, is a big signal to, uh, I mean, signals my resources, my wealth, my status in a, in a big way. Moving on. Right. So how does this manifest in other walks of life, right? Like in politics, like I said, a lot of almost 65 percent of India's Gen Z actually talks about, you know, wanting a government issued job. Right. But they're not not as excited about holding any political office or contesting elections. And again, like I said earlier, we don't know if they will go out and vote in large numbers. Right. So so this whole thing of I have very many, uh, you know, concerns, but I'm not sure I'm willing to commit to a political point of view. So they, they wish to stay politically neutral. And, and that's what we see uh, amongst this audience. Um, with regard to activism, I did speak about this earlier, but this, this whole thing of you know, LGBTQ rights, racial inequality, there are a lot of social concerns and diverse social concerns that they will talk about. But again, this is, this is also about you know, um, seeking group membership, right? So one of the interesting data points is that if you look at tender, Tinder bios um, you know, of people aged between 18 and 25, which would be at the center of the, of the Gen Z, you'll find that a lot of these words are actually trending. So environment, equality, climate change, all of this is, is actually trending on, on Tinder bio, uh, bios and which is, which is a very interesting data point there. On health, this is probably something that's been spoken about a lot. Uh, you know, a, a lot of articles have been written. A lot of investigation has happened into this. The fact that mental health is a worrying aspect for this generation, right? Um, and and it's been um, uh, we all talk about it. But I think the important reason, um, uh, you know, what is more important is to understand why why this is such a big uh, epidemic of sorts with with the younger generation, right? So it's a, if you look at their world and if you look at what has happened to their life. 
you'll see that a lot of their mental health problems are an outcome of having too many choices too early, right? Um, the fact that there is so much to choose from, uh, like I said uh, earlier, I mean, this is the generation that doesn't know of an era before social media, right? So there is a constant quest for validation from others. There are too many demands on themselves. They also have a wide variety of social concerns that, that you know, go way beyond the immediate context, right? So, so all of this actually contributes to um, you know the the kind of mental health issues that that we're seeing uh, amongst this uh, this generational cohort today. Moving on to the next slide. On fashion, I think uh, you know what we're really seeing seeing is that it's 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 not the Gen Zs moving from moving away from Indian wear. Uh, we do see that there is a lot of impulse purchase in the Indian wear space. They're also pushing the boundaries in in the Indian wear space while they're while they're buying into you know Western wear. Uh, on entertainment, now this is something that's known, K-pop and Korean dramas have been like a prominent huge subculture with, with Gen Z for the last few years, right? But also, what's also interesting is that if you if you look at bands like BTS, they've actually normalized the fact that makeup is genderless, for instance, right? So, so therefore, they align to, to this cohort's value system, which is about gender fluidity, for instance. I mean, look at them. They, they are a band that's so unapologetic about, uh, about fashion, about their love for fashion or makeup, right? Um, now, if you, look, if you look at consumption of Gen Z, you'll see that a lot of them say that they're more willing to consider buying from brands that actually represent more environmental and social causes, right? Almost 70% of them say that they're more willing to buy brands that stand up for these causes. Um, we also see amongst this generation that there are some, some things that actually work with them, like humor works very well, um, uh, you know, luxury works very, very well, satire works very well, actually dark humor works very well. This may also be indicative of the fact that, you know, uh, why moment and meme marketing is very uh, you know, popular amongst, amongst this generational cohort. So moving on, moving on to the next slide. So like like we like we've been seeing so far, there is a this is a generation that's that's got so many social uh, concerns. They want to be social inclus socially inclusive, but at the same time, they're also very highly self-absorbed, right? And in this context, it's very it's very interesting to examine the context of consumption. So consumption is not just about experiencing everything that's out there. It's not just about experiencing the world, but it's also about expressing oneself to it, right? So so one of the brand principles that you could you could look at is how do you co-create with this with this audience right that that could be an interesting way uh, to speak to them they do take their consumption choices seriously because you know uh, they, they they also invest time and effort in it because it's not just about like i said it's not just a pursuit but it's also a, a way of self-expression right and therefore um you know they, in in their world consumption and wider social concerns are not opposites and that's an important thing for us to understand about this cohort um so again in terms of branding principles Purpose, purpose could have, you know, communicating uh, purpose could could be a lot more meaningful uh, to this generational cohort than than the generational cohorts of the past because they do want to make larger statements about their belief system. Yeah, so yeah, that's all I have. We can move on to thanks, the next. Thanks, paper. Anjana. And if if you can come on camera, Mukul, yes, come on camera, and Aditya, if you can come back. Uh, I just have a housekeeping announcement uh, to our audience. Uh, please type in your questions in the question panel that you see on your uh, go-to console. Uh, we will bring them up at an appropriate time towards the end of the session. But just as a uh, uh, you know break for us panelists, you know I have some things. You know I'm just repeating some things that uh, kind of uh, stuck to my head. Um, Aditya, you you spoke about the regional differences, and it was quite interesting to note that uh, the so-called Southerners believe that. The customs and whatever else of their prior generation is is not at all something they would want to follow, and uh, there was a bit of a you know uh, context in the east which said they prefer joint families, um, and uh, the north and the south divide seems to continue in terms of the northerners indexing lower on that and saying they perhaps believe more of their customs should follow, right? So so somewhere you know I'm I'm just thinking aloud. This is my opinion. Uh, is uh, you know Gen Z is is truly not isolated from the environment they live in, right? So that's one interpretation, you know, I'm, I'm kind of taking on saying, of course, you know, there's a lot different, right? Uh, on, on the same note, Anjana, you, you pointed out to the fact that uh, there is a very strong 
uh, you know, social and uh, individual persona, right? As in, uh, and that that perhaps is uh, more formed, uh, you know, uh, in this generation as against any of the prior generations because uh, the circle of influence or people we interacted with uh, were usually a smaller cohort, whereas digital media or social allows you to have a persona, uh, you know, far beyond your immediate, uh, uh, you know, uh, network of people. Now, now with this with this in mind, uh, you know, on a lighter vein, a uh, question to you, Anjana, is that would I be Gen Z if I think non-linearly about getting fitter, right? I'm saying, you know, I'm going to wait and say, you know what, uh, you know, I could uh, perhaps exercise, I could get to the gym or I could cycle and, and think, you know, automatically things are going to happen, you know, would, would that make me Gen Z? <laughs> no, but let me let me answer that question a little more seriously. Uh, I, I know it was a joke, but um, you know, non-linearity. I think so. There is an important principle for us to think about, particularly when we look at Gen Z in the workplace, right? When you look at Gen Z in the workplace, I mean, if if their imagination of career is not so linear, how can employer brands create non-linearity and exponential growth possibilities for, for Gen Z is an important one, one for us to consider. I mean, are we designing our workplaces in the, in, in, in the old world context for them uh, is, is something. And I'm glad you spoke about linearity, even if it were, were as a joke, because I think it's an important principle uh, for, for many of us to consider to speak to them sharply. And I don't think you'll be Gen Z. <laughs> I don't think you'll right. be Gen Z. Yeah, I was waiting for that. I was waiting for that, right? All right. So so thanks, uh, Anjana and Aditya. Uh, I think, uh, you know, the good perspectives. Uh, Ashu Sabrawal, uh, Aditya commented on some of your slides saying that, you know, are the differences truly significant? Perhaps he not noted that the indices are not that different from 100. But I think, you know, what uh, the way I would uh, answer for you is saying that you're looking at a cross section of data and then seeing, you know, what's kind of skewing and then making that conclusion is what I feel about it. But I understand, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, there's a, you know, line drawn and saying this is Gen 1 and this is Gen 2 and there's dramatically, uh, you know, they're different, right? So it's a progression. Uh, so with that, I would say, uh, dear audience, uh, thanks for taking time. Uh, please keep your questions coming. And Mukul uh, will come on board and tell us why are Gen Z is the way they are. Uh, while Aditya, you know, gave us some numbers and said, uh, you know, how how uh, how how are they different? And Anjana spoke about who they are. So Mukul, over to you. Tell us why are Gen Z is the way they are, and perhaps at the end of it, tell me again why I can't be Gen Z, right? Okay. All right. Over uh, to you. You can you can uh, hear my voice, right, and see me clearly. Yes, Mukul. Yes, yes. Go on. Okay. Got it. So um, thank you. Uh, what I'm going to do is that uh, Aditya showed us a few numbers. Anjuna really deep dive into who this, who Gen Z really is. And I am perhaps in the next uh, 10 minutes going to try and answer why are the way that they are. Um, in the next few slides, what you'll see is that I'll focus on some six macro themes, which I want you to just keep in your mind as you sort of uh, listen to whatever I'm going to say. Um, first is that many times, you know, we were we were discussing Gen Z, we were discussing Gen Z, and it, when we were just uh, sort of setting up this session, it came as a surprise to some of us where where it was mentioned that oh, you know what, we keep thinking that Gen Z is still in college and Gen Z is still like studying and all that, just up and coming, but it's already been three to four years that they've already been in the workplace, so they've actually not just entered workplace, but they've also significantly sort of grown into it. The other thing that I want you to keep in mind is that. We're talking about a smartphone first generation, which has a great amount of tech access, which has further gotten amplified in the past three, four years. And there's a great amount of online enablement, which has happened because all the apps are really sort of trying to and buying for your attention and really enabling you online to do various things. Education is another thing. Education and aspiration is another thing to keep in mind. Um, education numbers, when, I, when we go outside of the metro, have been significantly improving in the past decade or so. Um, then migration has been on the highest uh, life context, the life context and parenting styles and Anjana also sort of hinted on that, but it's a very, very big component and a very big part of the fact that growing up, they have seen the world in a certain way. They've grown up with certain ideas in a certain way. And that is why you see them navigating certain tensions that Anjana had spoken about that Aditya had spoken about. And I'm going to now just try and we picked up a few things we will try and help uh, everybody understand why are Gen Z the way that they are. Next slide. 
Okay, first, like I said, being the first truly native, uh, uh, digital native generation, they actually don't view the world in the binaries like some of us of digital and physical. Um, a lot of, uh, when we sort of spoken to a lot of millennials, there's a lot of perspective about how online world is different and the offline world is different. But for a Gen Z, those intersect and they really merge into one particular universe. So offline and online are not so different between in their perspective. Social media, and in fact, a lot of work and the report that Aditya is also talking about, uh, also points to the fact that social media platforms have been shaping the view of the world and the ways of life, whether it is success, passion, the view of their relationships, politics, etc. In fact, social media, uh, project after project and category after category is emerging as the first point of contact for this person. But what is happening otherwise? because there is so much of attention because there's just so much of attention and so much of communication and a barrage of completely unlimited information sorting and assessing all this information is not the easiest task so they tend to take a helicopter view so ease of access and enormity of information hampers their ability to look beyond what is topical and it also hampers their ability to go search for something valuable and utilize it for their advantage and therefore you'd see now a lot of brands seems to be focusing on a lot of semiotic and a lot of visual of of value on their platform where you'd see that they are not really relying on the person to go and search for it they're trying to give it to them and make it accessible and available to them in the natural progression so that they're able to utilize it next slide second is impermanence in fact uh, Aditya talked about it, Anjana talked about it, Aditya, there was a lot of tension that was talked about, there was mental health and, and why it is the way that it is and the emphasis that it has, Anjana had spoken about that. There was a great amount of multidimensionality that also Anjana spoke about. We need to understand that at the root of it, impermanence is actually a way of life for this person. Not to say that earlier generations were not really uh, going through negative situations or there wasn't anything wrong happening in the world. But Gen Z through, its, through the course of its life has gone through various narratives of climate change, social, cultural and political instability, many, many movements, a lot of polarization. And it has actually done two things. It has made them very, very pragmatic and made uh, it has tempered their optimism. And at the same time, Whatever we say that, oh, they're not sure about what they want, they're not really, they don't really commit to one thing. Impermanence is really built into the way that they think about and respond to things because for them, this impermanence is not bad. It means that they're constantly evolving, questioning, pursuing multiple identities and various social groups and seeking various ways of expression and increased number of occasions. So, Again, impermanence is built into the psyche and is built into the life context as people have grown. For them, this impermanence is not necessarily a bad trait. For them, impermanence is a way of life. And therefore, you'd see that in terms of just broader interests and in terms of just broader themes and focus and things that they care about, there's a lot more topics than the generations before them. Next slide. Third. And this is where um, this is where I'll bring in what both Aditya and Anjana also focused on the entire similarities as well as differences between the Gen Zs of the metros and the non metros. But what one key thing to notice is that they are closer than they were ever before. Gen Z has many, many means of access to and avenues to read, explore, understand, question and influence others. They're not just sitting and accessing and just just consuming this information. They're also putting it out there in the world and accessing and influencing and discussing it. Mobile phone is a portal. It's a perpetual portal to get all kinds of answers. I hear something, I want to actually get into, get into my mobile phone, get into Wiki, get into Google and really build some sort of working knowledge around what it is that, that this entire concept is about. The internet enables them to look at where whatever language, whatever level of complexity they're looking at that. It has also resulted in a surge of micro moments, which Google had also emphasized on. And I think in the past two years, three years, it has really taken shape. The, the entire progression in a way has been thrown out of the window. Today, we are talking to a consumer for whom the, that entire progression, that entire pathway can start anywhere. 
at any particular touch point the experience journey can start absolutely anywhere i can be sitting i can be actually i can be lying down on my bed at 12 in the night and just go through instagram i like a particular shoe i go and buy it so we are talking to a person where you can't really predict where they are you can't really predict when they will start at what stage at what time so brands need to really be present wherever they're spending most time rather than expecting them to come to them and come to the platform and touch points which they are establishing next slide um diana Apologies, it's just a glitch. Just trying to play that. Not a problem. Yes. Um, quickly going to focus on the yeah next slide. Quickly going to focus on a couple of quick things. We talked about how the entire um, um, sort of digitization and really the tech influence and the social media influence is there. But this is a generation which is visual first. Videos and visuals are their view and the key to the world for discovering latest trends, helping them get through the day, content that reflects social and ethical movements. So they are a very visual, visual first generation. They're used to communicating and consuming visual first. Next slide. We'll, and sorry, it's not moving. Yes, uh, creators and my, micro influencers. You'd see that Gen Z has been brought up on content, has been brought up on social media, and they've been experiencing branding and influencer marketing so much that they're A, very skeptical of it, but they respond to creators and influencers who look like them, talk like them, speak like them, uh, and they are there's not an overtly commercial hook. You'd see that in a way, the language of communication in the past five, six years has also shifted where we are not our where the people that we're looking at or the or the protagonists that we're looking at in various kinds of communication from brands are not picture perfect so they're more closer to life and that you'll also see or uh, that also sort of uh, is the evidence for the fact that how creators and micro influencers today are becoming as influential as celebrities or maybe more this everyday personas is where uh, the creation of relatability happens and relatability to their to people that that are talking to them about brands and products is what they really aspire for. Next slide. Fourth, be it new trends, social movements, brand actions, and orienting the older generations with the way of life. Gen Zs are also becoming that generation which is the biggest catalyst of reverse influence, especially for their parents. And I want you to connect this with what Anjana said about and what Aditya said about familial relationships and how parental approval has become very important how family is becoming very important how they are really although it may sound uncharacteristic but they are very keen on having those family bonds you'd see that they are also really enabling decision making and choice making in a particular household be it orienting them to new apps content narratives concepts formats habits and we've seen it in our work that it gets further more amplified when we talk to non-metros. And in contrast, in life of Gen Z, in metros, friendships do take precedence. Anjana also talked about it. So we are saying that because of all of these things coming together, there is a great amount of reverse catalyst and reverse influence which is actually happening. And they are, because not just focusing on Gen Z would not just be about their choices and winning with them. It will also it is also likely to be a window to win with the older generations within their houses next and last slide yes i wanted to talk a little bit also about the indianness there is a great amount of pride that has in the past decade been really amped up in being indian it has become stylish it has become sexy yes i know we are also talking about a generation where uh, people going abroad for education, people going abroad to settle down there is on the rise. But the Indianness and the way that, they pe that people talk about it has actually opened up so many connotations other than nationalism. And this has happened at the back of a lot of Indian success stories of apps, startup founders, athletes, celebrities, personalities, global politics, so on and so forth. However, you are not talking to a person who has got blind love or hate for the country. They're looking out for more and more opportunities outside the country, like I said. But Gen Z, the young people of India are more proud and more assured of their Indianness. 
than the generations before them. And now what I'll do is that I'll hand over to Ashwini who will talk about a few myths and then leave you with a few questions to ponder. Over to you, Ashwini. Sorry, Sundar, I think. You want so to thanks, come in? Mukul. Uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm holding my questions, Mukul, in the interest of time. We'll take it in the Q&A at the end. Uh, Ashwini, if you can switch on your camera and come on board and do some myth busting for us. I'm sure there's a lot of work that you've done for your clients. And you've, you know, obviously gone and thinking something and, you know, post research, you come out actually, uh, you know, enlightened uh, with the dramatic yeah. change that you might have observed. So tell us yeah. some of the myths and, you know, what they, they definitely aren't. I mean, bust them for us, please. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So thanks, uh, you know, to the panelists who came in before me. I think there's a lot of interesting, you know, stuff which got spoken about. Uh, some of it we may already know you know, some of it may be new news and some of it may actually contradict, you know, some of the beliefs that we held about Gen Z. So my attempt through this section is to actually, you know, take a very sort of a simplistic lens to understand what are the myths about Gen Z and what are the actual realities when it comes to Gen Z. Next slide, please. So I've taken a very simple lens, which is, you know, the two uh, quadrants of the Johari window. So on the left side, you have what the world actually thinks and believes about Gen Z. And this is through, you know, discussions which we typically end up doing with either with experts or with parents or with, you know, a generation which is possibly uh, either one generation older or a couple of generations older compared to the Gen Z. And the second lens which is there is that how do the Gen Z actually think of themselves? Now, this is a very interesting dichotomy and I don't think this is something which is a new or relevant only to Gen Z, because this is something that each generation faces where they feel that they are one of the most misunderstood sort of generation. So the idea over here is to take you through four or five, you know, myths. Some of these we've already spoken about, and we will try and, you know, illustrate some of these two examples. Yeah, move to the next slide, please. Uh, so the previous presenters, you know, did speak about this myth in a fair bit of detail. Uh, so Commonly, you know, when we speak to people, there is a belief that Gen Z is this one whole, you know, homogeneous set of people because they are digital natives, they belong to the digital world. So their beliefs, their value systems and all could be very similar. And in fact, uh, the belief is also that across countries, whether you look at the Western world or you look at the Eastern world, there would be a fair bit of similarity when it comes to Gen Z because the influences are quite similar. But in reality, what happens is that while the narrative it's, is somewhat similar, the influencers are similar, you know, digital has brought the world a lot more closer. The economical, uh, you know, the economic, political and cultural dynamics of a country actually play a huge role when it comes to creating distinct identities. Now, if you look at Italy, then Italy has the aging population. Now, given that the, you know, the 50 plus or the 60 plus are actually much more than the Gen Z, as compared to India, the attitudes, the beliefs, you know, the government interaction itself is quite different when it comes to these countries. You look at China and you look at India, uh, then overall, you know, the sentiment and the confidence that the Gen Z actually displays in their own future is much higher as compared to the Western world, whether you look at USA or you look at France. So overall, yes, while social media does provide access and exposure, the manifestation of the aspiration could be a little bit different. Uh, to give you a very you know, simple sort of an example, uh, freedom is something that is universal and that whether you speak to a Gen Z in a metro or in a smaller town, both want freedom, right? But perhaps when you speak to a Gen Z in a bigger town or in a metro, their definition of freedom could be that, you know, I can decide for myself whether I want to marry or not marry at all. Whereas if you speak to somebody in a smaller town, freedom could just mean being able to select one's own partner or, you know, looking beyond one caste when it comes to selecting, you know, your own partner. So clearly, you know, while the broad aspiration of freedom remains, the manifestation of each of these aspirations could be a little bit different. Uh, next slide, please. Um, we've spoken a lot about how, uh, you know, Gen Z are digital natives. They're led by social media. Uh, social media actually rules all part of their lives. There are enough and more reports which seem to suggest that, uh, you know, Gen Z actually ends up spending anything between six to eight hours on social media. 
so while that may be true, uh, what is interesting is that Gen Z is actually cognizant of the pitfalls of social media. So it's not an aimless or a you know mindless pursuit of social media or you know uh, browsing which is happening. But social media is actually being used very judiciously to create a carefully curated identity. And it's uh, you know serving many more motivations and giving avenues when it comes to personal uh, you know fulfilling one's personal goals, whether it comes to you know career aspirations, ensuring that one has different career paths that one can look at. Next slide, please. Um, again, something that you know people, especially the older generation, tends to believe about Gen Z that they are yes they are individualistic. But there is also a perception that they're self-centered. They live only for themselves. They care only about themselves. But in reality, and we've heard Mukul as well as Anjana speak about this, they are as family-oriented family as any other cohort. Family is core to them. Uh, you know, values of uh, respect, uh, you know, to a certain extent, tradition remain equally important for them. In fact, you know, some studies which have been done uh, seem to suggest that Gen Z are as religious as their older generations. They actually consider family to be a key priority and parents are actually their 4 a.m. friends. Um, in fact, Mukul did speak about, you know, this reverse trend which is actually happening where Gen Z is coaching and guiding their parents to meet their aspirations. So you hear a lot of 45 and 50 year olds talking about how they've taken on a profession because they were actually, uh, you know, pushed or encouraged by their kids per se. Uh, interestingly, when we speak to people, you know, arranged marriage is still in and uh, Gen Z in smaller towns or even larger towns for that matter are quite okay with their parents actually selecting a partner for them. Uh, career choices like IS and government jobs still remain one of the preferred, you know, choices, especially when you look at the smaller towns. Next slide, please. This is like a very interesting myth, you know, and we've heard a lot about and we read a lot about how Gen Z are woke. They're very politically aware. They have an activist mindset. You know, they're involved in a lot of causes. But it's interesting to know, and I think some of the previous speakers did hint on hint about that. They're not politically inclined. In fact, you know, uh, some survey which was done seemed to suggest that more than 60% actually did not vote in the last elections. And in fact, don't plan to vote even in the future. So what they actually do is that, uh, you know, they select causes which are actually very close to their heart. So it's not just randomly following everything that seems to be trending or you know uh, uh, being spoken about, but they take causes where they feel they can genuinely make a difference and which actually have a uh, impact on them personally. So some of the causes which are close to their heart are around environment. Uh, you know there are could be animal causes. There could be even human issues such as gender and diversity is a big big you know thing amongst the um, uh, Gen Z per se. Next slide, please. Finally, the last myth that I wanted to speak about was this, you know, whole bit around how Gen Z look for instant gratification and are impulsive. Yes, to a certain extent, they do have, you know, uh, I mean, they do look for instant gratification. They are impulsive. They do have short term goals. But at the same time, there is a certain kind of clarity that they have about where they want to be, what they want to do and how to get there eventually. Uh, I think one of the reasons why, you know, this thing around impulse and self gratification and putting their, you know, uh, possibly feet in different shoes seems to be there is that they know that success is not easy or quick. So while there are lots of, you know, success stories which they come to know about on Instagram and other means of social media, it's they know that this is possibly, you know, one in a hundred who's going to attain that kind of success. With increasing competition, they also feel that, you know, they need to actually, uh, you know, uh, put their hands in different kinds of areas. So it's not while they are goal, you know, while there are certain goals which are there, it's not necessarily that the path to achieve those goals is only one. There could be different, you know, five different things that they could be looking at. And so there is a sort of a jugadu kind of a mindset which is actually there when it comes to Gen Z. Yeah. Moving on. 
so finally uh, in the interest of time i just you know quickly wanted to take you through some points to ponder uh, one was from a marketing you know perspective and the other was also from a from a research fraternity perspective what are the kind of things that we need to keep in mind so uh, definitely i think you know this is something which one of the earlier presenters also talked about which is that uh, do we look at how can we actually help the small town gen z because while they have aspirations uh, there are limitations there are challenges there are you know lack of opportunities which are actually there and can marketers actually hold their hand in and in helping to achieve their aspiration this could be through coaching it could be through guidance and upskilling it could even be you know in terms of low cost financing opportunities which will help them to uh, possibly look at you know entrepreneurial sort of opportunities which are there what about communication codes you know what kind of communication code should be looked at now definitely uh, this i mean we all know that this generation doesn't have like a long you know uh, attention span content needs to be snackable they are very visual oriented they uh, love consuming reels they love consuming videos they talk in emojis icons so that's the kind of language that marketers actually need to speak to them so that they are able to connect with the audience per se uh second is in terms of influencers now this is an interesting area because you know what we've noticed is that it's not necessarily the large celebrities who are actually influencers but it's actually you know people like them who made it big because those are the people who are actually more relatable and aspirational and it provides a sort of an achievable aspirational instead of having the top celebrities a family centricity we've spoken about is at the core so it's important to keep that in mind while working on any communication and this whole code of you know about around indianness so they don't want to blindly ape the west there is a lot of uh, you know pride in the indian culture which is there and that's something that we need to harness um some of the you know causes i mean the three causes which we've noticed are actually quite important and close to their heart are gender issues the other is around inclusivity and the third is of course around you know climate change and they're trying to do their own little thing when it comes to these three issues which are there uh, moving on to the last slide so uh, finally we just wanted to you know end with some thoughts in terms specifically for the mr community about how do we actually talk to them uh, yeah so definitely you know given it's a digital first sort of a population a segment uh, we need to look at you know digital tools digital tools which are engaging for them so it could be online forums it could be communities it could be you know instagram chats uh, we actually need to create a tribe to talk to them so that they feel that they are like minded people in that community with whom they can actually interact of course we need to keep it short and bite size so you know two hour three hour groups one hour questionnaires or something definitely which are out uh, have a mix of techniques so just because they are digital does not mean that we do everything digital but it's important to have a face to face you know component to understand who they are in reality uh rely more on visual medium to draw out information so they talk i mean more than you know words they actually talk in emojis they talk in pictures they're comfortable you know sharing reels and videos about their life rather than you know telling us uh, about their lives in long sentences so definitely in terms of techniques that's what we need to look at ask less and observe more this is i mean not only for gen z but per se it's something that we need to keep in mind and the last point is around making you know whatever interaction whatever discussion that we have with them engaging in terms of topics in terms of gamification they love games so you know whether it's uh, in your quant surveys or in qualitative you know try and see how what kind of games we can actually put in give them tasks to do you know because that again makes it a lot more interactive and engaging in uh, the other thing is you know bring out what's in it for them because it's not enough to say that you know this is a market research pro project you're going to get some incentive at the end of it but tell them a little bit more about how they're going to contribute to probably you know uh, a brand's progress or it could be contribution to the community itself and finally of course keep in mind who speaks to them you know can that person actually uh, you know is 
that person able to speak their lim lingo, understand their lingo, and be able to relate to them. Um, yeah, so that's it from me. Thanks, Thank Ashwini, you, and Iran. that was uh, uh, quite quite informative. And you did bust a fair number of myths, I would say, at least for me. Uh, there are a number of questions from our audience, uh, you know, and you know, obviously there is a constraint of time. What I would like to announce is that uh, you, uh, you know, all of you can get to the MRSI website for the recording of this uh, session. What you would also find with the session is responses to questions that we perhaps have not been able to take up for the paucity of time. Uh, we would have our panelists respond to them and it will be hosted along with the uh, videos. But let me uh, say that we have uh, decided to extend this session by a couple of minutes uh, and I'm just posting uh, one of the questions uh, that to me looked interesting, it it was from Aisha Shaikh. Uh, you know, all she says, uh, you know, I'm, I'm better, I mean, I'm rephrasing, of course. She's saying all this is fine. What's the future? You know, what do you think the Gen Z will do going forward? You know, uh, so it's it's obviously an opinion. It's not data. It's not. But I'm sure we've lived through. You know, our eight. You know, we were 18 at times. We were 35 at times. I don't know. I'm at least 15 now. So. I'm definitely not Gen Z. We went through those motions. We we mocked. So so if we can go uh, in the same order in which uh, we presented. So Aditya, your opinion on one thing that you think uh, you know uh, you think Gen Z will be, and you know uh, in the next five years. You know obviously the next generation will kick in. I don't know whether we have a name for that generation yet. Uh, but what is your view on some of the things, or pick any one topic that kind of uh, you know. Uh, interested you and say this is what I see Gen Z as in the next five years, you know. So each of you can say this is what I see Gen Z as in the next five years. Just here. The initiatives are more vocal about uh, their ideas, so that okay. is something that okay. is going to uh, pick up, and they have uh, now started earning. They are for from I mean from last four years they're a part of the workforce now. Uh, and definitely their opinion is something which is going to matter for uh, uh, brands as such in future. They, they will speak with their money, I get it. Okay. <laughs> All right. uh, Anjana, over to you. You know, Sundar, when I look at the Gen Z, I feel that they are going to um, reframe the way they're going to be looking at relationships um, because of who they are, uh, how they're going to look at the concept of marriage, um, you know, how they're going to deal with relationships, uh, uh, you know, how they're going to look, how they're going to look at parenting, how many children they choose to have. I think, I think there, there will be a lot of, um, a lot of change in the way we've always looked at some of those social constructs. Um, I, I also feel that they, they're going to be way more financially literate than, and educated than uh, the previous generations, and that could have a whole lot of meaning and significance for a whole lot of, uh, whole lot of brands. Um, again, I, I spoke about this in my in my talk, but purpose, uh, sustainability, uh, you know, working working for larger causes. Um, I think uh, those those will have uh, greater meaning as well. So um, I, I'm I'm getting a sense that we'll we'll move to a positive space on a on a lot of lot of those things. So I think they'll also teach us what to prioritize in life, you know, and how to prioritize those things. So I'm I'm very positive about you know, how they're going to shape the world. Okay. Thanks. Uh, uh, over to you, Mukul. I'll go next. Uh, actually, um, I don't think, like, to be honest, I don't think any of us would really know what will happen five years down the line with this generation, to be honest. Um, I think we need to stop looking for that answer um, because I don't think that there is a very clear answer or there's going to be an answer. I think we need to really mic do a micro breakdown when we are trying to really understand this generation. And I don't think that five year horizon, I think five in five years time, they'll maybe change three times over. And there might be newer generations and newer influences and other things. So I think we need to pick up various elements of their lives and not try to, I know with millennials, we've tried a broad brush approach in terms of, okay, these are 10 things to look forward, these are 15. But there are so many aspects and so many dimensions to their lives that I think we need to look at when we say what next, what exactly, where, which part of life are we talking about? Are we talking relationships? Because that will move differently. Are we talking tech? That will move differently. 
are we talking their work life and how they are looking at four generations in workplace and responding that will move differently so i don't think there's a meta answer to be honest i think the approach to go with them is super micro and we break down what aspect like what aspect of their lives are we really trying to answer that question for so i think that would be my answer thanks mukul ashwini your views please you are the midbuster yeah yeah so you know the disadvantage of always going last is that you have to really hunt for something new to say so yeah so uh, i mean of course it's very difficult to predict the future and you know because exactly the myth buster you know session was an attempt to do that because you know there were certain preconceived notions that we had but in reality the gen z is actually a different animal altogether but i think one thing which i've noticed is that they're not afraid to take risks unlike a lot of us uh, i mean of course i'm much older than them but the previous generations i mean we were all you know constricted a little bit by uh, you know wanting safety security wanting to you know go the traditional path and all but these this generation is not afraid to take risks so that's going to mean a lot of positive things because in terms of they can experiment a lot more they can become entrepreneurs at a really early age without fear of you know things not really working out they can actually uh, you know make the world a better place so immense opportunities and immense possibilities is something that i would envisage you know for them and it's in their hands really to make sure that you know they're able to hold on to their dreams and make things happen thank you so uh, just a uh, you know uh, thanks marvin uh, the next generation is called gen alpha you know i somewhere it was in my head but now it kind of is clear so gen alpha is coming up soon um, and just one question you know who exactly do we dis- define as gen z is it when i was born or is it some of these attitudes uh, so so that's my last question before we wrap up uh, so So I think which way Sundar you will not be Gen Z. <laughs> Whichever definition right. you want to look at, you will not be Gen Z. <laughs> All right, okay. Uh, that's that's fine. You know, I'll I'll accept that. So so is there a calendar year definition then? Yes, uh, there is a calendar yeah, year is, definition. Yeah. I think Aditya did speak about it. Yeah, but you know, it's I would say it's not such a watertight. you know kind of compartment so while technically yes it is supposed to fall under a certain age but you would always have you know people who are millennials and who reflect a similar kind of you know mindset which is there right, right. so right. in fact i think one last which is that we've actually seen post 90s millennials operate very very close to the way that yeah. gen z does so i don't think that millennials also is one cohort really like a lot of people on the intersection post 90s millennials are very very similar in terms of behaviors across various aspects of their lives got it but there i do oh, right. feel so uh, yeah go on anjana sorry yeah i do feel that um, you know the 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 context that you're born into uh, goes a long way in shaping your defining attitudes right so it it does differentiate you vis-a-vis the the previous cohorts right so so i do feel that there is there are some patterns uh that you see basis what you're born into what the social cultural context has been the econ- economics of it all the politics of it all it definitely has a bearing so i would say the the era that you grew up in the socialization has a huge huge role to play in in shaping a generational cohort yep thank you and i think uh, you know i'll just try to sum up a few key points that i'll remember for some time to come anjana you made the point saying that this is perhaps the first generation that has been born in the consumer era right so they speak with their money more than perhaps some other things right and and aditya you, you know you kind of put the numbers up there and said uh, you know there are differences even though they are a cohort uh, what stuck to my mind was the regional differences uh, it's it's uh, perhaps a continuation to the point that uh, anjana made of the context that you are born into you carry some of that Uh, mukul you you spoke about uh, why are the way they are um, and you know what defines them in their experiences and uh, the context of uh, uh, you know uh, the digital uh, uh, you know environment in which they operate and ashwini you did uh, a fair bit of mythbusting in terms of saying that they are not as fluffy as you think they are they are very sharp um, and i can you know watch for that the next generation i interact with at that age i probably knew half the things that they know 
so so they're really smart they're very well informed uh, and and uh, like all of you said uh, you know they they perhaps born into a independence that did not exist for the prior generation uh, and i think that was uh, what one of the uh, audience made as a question smash comment in saying that, uh, and, and it kind of reflects what Anjana you said, is what you're born into is what you take forward. So perhaps this is a generation that's been born into an environment where there is uh, financial freedom, uh, perhaps coming from a slightly better off earlier generation, uh, you know, that's giving them that, uh, you know, ability to take those risks. And Anjana, uh, sorry, Ashwini, you mentioned that, let's hope they use this gift from the prior generation to actually make a difference for all of us. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for taking a lot of time uh, to put this together. Uh, very informative content. Uh, sorry, we just had one hour to kind of, uh, you know, have this discussion. Uh, but audience, you know, uh, log in into MRSI's website. Uh, we will also shortly announce the next webinar. Uh, watch your emails uh, if you have already registered. Quite an interesting session coming up, I can tell you that. Uh, and thank you again. Uh, thanks for taking this afternoon to be with us. Thank you, panelists, and thank you, audience. Good evening thank and thank you everybody. We'll all have rain soon. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye.